in. I have some of your colleagues outside doing uh, something else, an exercise uh, for you. I'm going to go and check on them in a moment. Um, but for all of you, I want you to take a minute on your own and think about whether you would have decided that Mrs. Paul's graph would succeed in her claim against the Long Island Railroad. And I want you to place your enthusiasm for Mrs. Paul's graph's recovery on a scale from 1 to 10. So if you are really gung-ho, you would argue to the death about Mrs. Paul's graph recovering in this case from Long Island Railroad, you're at 1. And if there is no way you could possibly be persuaded that Mrs. Paul's graph would win, that is Long Island Railroad, should, of course, uh, not only not pay any damages to Mrs. Paul's graph, but perhaps even be awarded costs for having to live through this hassle of being dragged to the Court of Appeal, then that's a 10. So on your own, I want you to give yourself how strongly you feel about the result in this case, where you would have gone if you were sitting on the New York Court of Appeals, when you to decide on a number from one, strong Mrs. Paul's graph recovery, to ten, no way does Mrs. Paul's graph recover. So take a moment and find a number for yourself. You've got to commit to some number. Okay, so if you put down a number from 1 to 5, that of course means that you would agree with Justice Andrews. You may not agree with the reasoning, we're going to work through the reasoning today. Um, but a 1 to 5, who had 1 to 5? Justice Andrews. Now everybody has to put up a hand for one of these. You must commit, right? That if you're a judge on the New York Court of Appeals, there's no option of saying, I'm going to sip this one out, right? Okay, so the Andrews people. Okay, 6 to 10. If your number was a 6 to 10, you're a Cardozo person. Uh -huh. So I will see, I always do this at the beginning of this class to see whose minds I have to change over the two hours. Okay, good. So now I want you to just sit back, except for my nine volunteers. Well, they weren't really volunteers. I kind of chose them. But three of your colleagues from each of the sections, you're all somewhere here, right? Yeah. You haven't disappeared. Good. They're going to uh, show us Paul's graph right up here.
might be enacted happened in 1924, but by the time it gets to the Court of Appeals, it's 1928, New York Court of Appeals decision. It's important to keep in mind because of another very crucial case that you've seen briefly in the fall and we'll look at in more depth uh, <clears throat> next Friday with Professor Smith in his plenary and then move past that. Which case? Don Kevin Stevenson, what year? 32. Okay, so something just to keep in mind to situate the decision in Paul's graph. But so as we saw, right, it's not a very difficult story. Who's the defendant? There's a lot of come to it. The railroad. Did we have someone playing the railroad? Ah, but they're not the railroad, right? But Long Island Railroad is the defendant, you're right. Long Island Railroad is the defendant because of vicarious liability, exactly. So who did we see? Of course, the guards. The guards are the employees of Long Island Railroad. There is no problem here with any of the factors that we need for a vicarious liability claim. They're clearly doing what they're supposed to be doing. <coughs> in their job, their employees, it turns out that what they did was wrongful. That was found at trial. They were negligent in their pulling and pushing. And so, a fault, negligence, <coughs> Long Island Railroad would answer for that. Long Island Railroad, of course, has done nothing wrong, but at the trial was held responsible for the consequences of the guard's fault. Okay, so a little <coughs> review right, of what we've uh, seen. Here's my man holding a package. It was a good package that fell down here. Luckily, it wasn't fireworks. It explode. I'm, I'm waiting for the year when the students can actually manage to have the package explode and have everybody stampede. Um, so, right, so here he comes. He's carrying this package gets onto the train, one guard pulls him, the other guard pushes him, he gets onto the train, the train pulls away, but in the meantime, the package falls, and boom. We need to put the boom here, right? There we go, and then, Ben, what were you playing? Oh, you were Mrs. Paul's graph, sorry. Yes. <laughs> you're the one who got tackled, and you're... Oh, on a scale. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Michael, okay, so Michael played the scale. As you read this case, did anybody envisage what was going on? Has anybody seen scales like this? What are we talking about? The scales fell and hurt Mrs. Paul's graph. Yes, it's a weighing machine. It's tall, it's heavy, it's on the platform <clears throat> at the train station. Has anyone ever seen one at a train station? Some people have. They still do exist, but yes, not as common as we can imagine they would have been in 1928. So here's the scales, <laughs> and yes, the scales fall. And what happens to Mrs. Paul's graph? <laughs> Something like this. Scales.
The judges don't tell us at the Court of Appeal. Perhaps they don't care. Right? There's been some injury. We imagine that it's an injury that is recognized. Right? That at trial, Mrs. Palsgraf wouldn't have won unless she had established three things. Right? The three things that you all know, inside and out. What did we just, we saw this, the, the story here. You see it represented. It's not as beautiful up here as it was in real life, right, in action. Right, you see it up here. What are the three elements of a successful claim in negligence that Mrs. Paul's graph does obviously establish? Injury, okay. What's the first thing, the trigger? Fault on the part of the guard. Yes, and causation. There is a factual causal link between the wrongdoing of the guards and the injury suffered by Mrs. Paul's graph. We have all the three <coughs> major elements of a successful claim. You've learned about all those elements. They are all satisfied here. Ostensibly, we should just kind of wipe our hands, right, and say, we're done. All the pieces have been established. <coughs> we're finished. Well, the reason we're not finished is precisely the reason that this course is not finished. Right? We've had the three elements. You know them all. You know that they have to be established. And now, for the coming weeks in this course, we are going to talk about how it's not that simple. Sometimes, you can have fault or a substitute, a trigger for liability. You can have a factual causal link. No problem with saying, but for the negligence here, Mrs. Paul's graph would not have been hurt. And you can have a recognized injury for which damages can be <coughs> assessed. And still, you might say that the plaintiff is not successful. And that is exactly what Paul's graph talks about. Different ways of telling us that there are limits on liability. That the scope of one's liability, even when one has acted carelessly, or right, another version of wrongful behavior, you've seen a number of those versions um, in the fault term, and even when your actions have caused recognized injury to another, you may not be held responsible. <coughs> so Paul's graph, reading Paul's graph, and rereading Paul's graph, I hope that your professors told you that I expected you to read this two or three times. Oh, my students remembered that I asked them to read it two or three times. Paul's graph is this crucial case that introduces you to the theme of the second half of the course, that is delineating liability. So we've talked about how to attribute liability, how it is that liability for the consequences of one action might kick in. And now we're going to talk about how that liability is shaped, is given some contour, is indeed limited in some situations. And we're going to, over the coming weeks, talk about <coughs> different ways in which, different mechanisms that exist in the private law of civil wrongs, different ways in which we do that delineating work, in which we say, ah, we may have wrongdoing, causation, injury, but still responsibility for what happened to this plaintiff is not on the shoulders of this defendant. <coughs>
It is, according to some commentators, the only torts case found in every single American torts case book or course materials for first year students. Every first year student in a tort law course in the US reads Paul's graph. Now we're not in the US, right? Maybe we shouldn't really care what the New York Court of Appeals has to say. It turns out that Paul's graph is also the American case most reproduced and taught and discussed in common law torts courses around the world. So English tort law students are reading Paul's graph. Australian tort law students are reading Paul's graph. <coughs> Your colleagues in other Canadian <coughs> law faculties are reading Paul's graph. I hope by the end of today's session you will have some sense of what why is this such an important case? What is it about reading and rereading the words of Justice Cardozo and the words of Justice Andrews that help us enrich our insight and our understanding about the very kind of core or kind of fundamental shape nature of the obligation owed that we all owe to act with appropriate care to others around us. At McGill, right, you will see, and I will underscore how significant Paul's graph is, because it very nicely, this is basically the conclusion of today's lecture, but I'll give it to you up front and then <clears throat> show you um, uh, why that's the conclusion. It nicely embodies the coexistence of approaches to the scope of liability found in traditions and systems that work with one general obligation, such as Quebec civil law, and with the Anglo-Canadian common law tradition that, of course, separates the different wrongs into different torts. <coughs> and this case is a crucial case where we learn something about the very nature of the obligation, the duty of care in the tort of negligence. The approaches coexist. You couldn't imagine a better judgment for the integrated teaching and learning of the private law of civil law. Because as we will see, right, we can find <coughs> substantive civil law and common law approaches together in this judgment. And I will also talk about how we will see coexisting forms of judgment, usually associated with common law and civil law, in the writing of these judges, in the way in which they structure and present their judgments. Mm -hmm. And finally, if we think about Cardozo and Andrews as teachers, we see the coexistence of <clears throat> different styles of pedagogy or teaching, ways in which to learn and engage with the, <coughs> um, uh, the shape, the form, the substance of this area of law, and to think about um, its methodology and how it develops. Okay. I'm going to get my voice on the rest. Now what I'd like you to do for the next few minutes is, and I will just kind of split you right here. Everyone on this side of the room, I'd like you to take a look at Cardozo's judgment and pick out like your favorite little sentences or phrases. Okay? So I'll highlight everybody should have at least one or two kind of key phrases. And he, of course, writes with this particular rhetorical flourish. I hope you know this. Right? So there should be some uh, good little phrases. My second year students this past fall in advanced common law obligations noted the similarities between Cardozo's writing and the way in which Yoda speaks in Star Wars. So we take a look for where there might be some good sentences in there. And over here, I want you to do the same thing with Justice Andrews' judgment. A little longer judgment, but also some nice sentences that might have struck you as either persuasive or problematic. Either one, but sentences that stood out for you, that
that you think kind of embody and illustrate his approach to this case. Okay, so take five minutes, just find a few lines, and we'll share some of those, and then we'll go into depth on the two uh,
okay, so, right, we knew that, right? <laughs> that you can't just show, here I am, I've been hurt, compensate me, so if you want redress, that's not enough, and why does Cardozo even put that in there when everybody knows that? I mean, it seems like that's kind of the basic, like, it, 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 seems, okay. it seems like you're saying that it's so, it, it wouldn't have been reasonable to expect. Okay, so we'll come back to, to the, the argument, but perhaps he's restating an obvious thing because he actually is kind of poking fun at the other side and saying that's really all you have to stand on. And didn't you know that very basic thing that all first year students learn very quickly? You can't just say, look at me, I've been hurt. I think it's you, right? You did something, you compensate me. So kind of belittling the <coughs> counter argument. Another good line, keywords, yeah. Um, so Colonel says uh, life will have uh, to be made over and human nature transformed to be for provision. So extravagant and the excessiveness of the most common that's in your standards which we get in Okay, so life would have to be made over, right? If we accepted a theory of provision, foreseeability so extravagant as to allow for this claim. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so the, he, there, and again we're going to come back and look more carefully at the judgment, but he is trying to distinguish right, the different what, relationships right, between potential defendants and a plaintiff, a complainant. He does that repeatedly in the judgment, different versions of relations that he says would give rise to a claim all to show us that this is not one that will do that. Anything else that shows us? What? Where's Mrs. Poulter? Why isn't she being... Well, the, the risk reasonably, reasonably be perceived defines the duty to be obeyed. And, and risk is important for the region. Yes, very nice. Okay, so... <laughs> that's a nice short one that I can write down. So, risk imports relation. And what was the very first part? The, the risk reasonably to be perceived defines the duty to be obeyed. Okay, so the risk reasonably perceived defines the duty to be obeyed. So we're going to we have to figure out how reasonable it is to foresee this risk, the provision, right? And then ask, is that so extravagant that we cannot actually uh, ground a duty <coughs> on uh, in this particular situation. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, it's loud, loud, loud. Yes. Even then, the orbit of the danger, as disclosed to the eye of reasonable vigilance, would be the orbit of the duty. Uh -huh. Ah. So, right, this idea of the orbit of the danger, and who determines, from what perspective do we determine the orbit? Pardon? From what perspective do we determine the orbit? Is the second part of the sentence. Okay, from the eye of reasonable vigilance. Okay, so we're going to figure out, now you have some perspective <coughs> grounded in reasonable vigilance. That, of course, is referring to what? Who has to act with reasonable vigilance? And if not, what happens? How do we characterize your behavior? Negligent, exactly. So right, there's a little slippage here perhaps that we'll watch out for when we return to Cardozo's judgment about kind of whether or not we have reasonable behavior and <clears throat> what the connection is between figuring out whether we have reasonable behavior on one hand and then figuring out the stretch or the orbit of the obligation on the other. Any last sentence? Words here. Okay, we'll leave it there. <coughs> Just as Andrews. <coughs> oh, there's some nice sentences in here. Yep. But the natural results of a negligent act, the results which a prudent man would or should foresee, do have a bearing upon the decision as the proximate cause. Uh huh. Okay. So, what is he introducing that we don't see talked about in the main four paragraphs? It's a pretty.
dense but short judgment on the part of Cardozo. This last little bit. Exactly, okay. All right, another good line from Andrews at the back. I paraphrase that he says the duty to one, the duty to all. Okay, so yes, a duty to all. We owe a duty to all others in society. In fact, he actually goes so far as to say the duty is owed to society, to everyone around us. Uh, it does not matter that they are unusual, unexpected, unforeseen, and unforeseen. Okay. A little louder. Say oh, that again. Okay. It does not matter that they are unusual, unexpected, unforeseen, or unforeseenable. And what are the they? <coughs> the damage or the... And the injury that happens. That's right. So the consequences, we don't just erase liability if they are any of those things, right? Unforeseen. <laughs> what are the others? Uh, unusual, unexpected, unforeseen, unforeseen. Okay, unusual. Is this unusual, this story? Yeah, a little bizarre, right? Unexpected, yes. Right? You don't usually wait for a train and think that somebody's going to be dropping fireworks and having a huge explosion on the track. Unforeseen, did anyone foresee this? No. Unforeseeable, that one might be tricky, right? And he's saying it doesn't matter, even if this was unforeseeable. Let's come back. Any other sentences that struck you? Because of convenience of public policy of a rough sense of justice, the law arbitrarily declines to trace a series of events beyond a certain point. Okay, so he says convenience, public policy. Uh, public policy, a, a rough sense of justice. Yeah, and then he uses a pretty strong word. Arbitrarily. Okay. <coughs> okay, so he's saying, and again we're going to come back and look a little bit more carefully in a few minutes to Justice Andrews' judgment. We're really going to unpack these two judgments. But he actually says, right, I don't know exactly how to give you guidance. It's all a question of convenience, public policy, a rough sense of justice, and the judge, based on those things, arbitrarily draws a line, delineates the scope of liability, declines the possibility of recovery for damages. <clears throat> My guess is that as good first-year students in law, you weren't particularly persuaded by that. And then, in fact, you found that a little problematic, right? What are we supposed to do with that? How are we supposed to figure out convenience, a rough sense of justice? Is that really true that that's what the judges are doing? That'll be something that you spend actually quite a lot, lot of time in a few weeks grappling with when you <coughs> focus on proximate cause. So hold on to that sentence. You'll want to come back to it at the end of February, early March. Anything else? Uh, such is the language of the street. Uh -huh. uh, I was <laughs> <laughs> And what is he talking about there? Uh, well, he's talking about, uh, well, he's talking about kind of a popular conception of the wrong to the public. Okay, okay. So, right, this rough sense of justice might not actually just come from the judge's head, but actually perhaps should correspond to how the streets would take a look at the situation. Okay, so when I asked you at the beginning of class how many of you would have agreed with Cardozo, how many with Andrews, it was quite striking how many would agree with Cardozo. Now, I'm going to come back, as I say, to what each of these judges is saying, why, how, what are the sources, what's the point of the approach, how convincing is the judgment. My guess is that a lot of you who said no recovery, and <coughs> Justice um, uh, Professor Prosser in the US quotes a first year student of his uh, in class. So you have to watch out. You never know when something that you say will end up being uh, quoted in an article. Um, that a student puts up his hand and says, the whole thing seems cockeyed and far-fetched. I mean, isn't this kind of ridiculous? This whole story 
<laughs> and so that's the reason that I don't think Mrs. Paul's graph should be covered. Now notice neither of the judges can give that as a reason. And indeed, Professor Prosser goes on. Thank you. Professor Smith is worried that I'm not going to have a voice by the end of today. Well, then you don't have to listen to me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the point is right. It was way over there. 
28. On the other side, far away from where this is all happening. So Itai, come up here. Okay, stand here. You'll be fine. Olivia, you come on up too. So this is where it, you know the students I know get picked on. Stand here. Where's your other boot? <laughs>
And this very particular kind of flourish, the way in which he chooses his words, is particularly significant for Cardoso. And uh, many people have written about Paul's graph. There's also, and I will uh, quote from it later, a remarkable biography of Cardozo by Andrew Kaufman. It is worth reading, but it is a long, uh, intense read. But he really is known. He was <coughs> Chief Justice of the New York Court of Appeals and then briefly a judge on the Supreme Court of Canada before he uh, died at the age of 68. But he's known as very literary. He is choosing his words. Okay, so what are some of the words in that first little paragraph? He's clearly choosing to sway our <coughs> sympathies here. Package of small size. Ah, package of small size, right. So you're supposed to think that's a very small little package. Again, in the trial record, the package was <coughs> at least a foot and a half long. <laughs> Not that small, okay? That's the thing here. Yeah? He describes the stairs as being at the other end of the platform. Okay, so we talked about that already, right? That's where you got this idea. You probably just absorbed it that Mrs. Paul's graph was far away, the scales, many feet away, the other end of the platform. I think in the description also, he really insists on the fact that the guards were trying to help the men. Ah, as well. Yes, look at the way in which he describes what the guards are doing. First, he says the man was unsteady, as if about to fall. A guard right, reaches forward to help him in. So, and this is re repeated later, he's pretty skeptical about something that he can do nothing about, which is a finding at the trial level that in fact there was wrongful behavior, there was negligence. You cannot question that, that is a question of fact. It was decided that this was unreasonable behavior on the part of the guards, but he seems a little skeptical about this, right? And he uses words to make us feel like, this was very justified behavior by the guards to help someone who might otherwise have fallen. And also he uses the word uh, dislodged to uh, talk about package. Instead of saying that he was thrown or you know, pushed by the guard, he just uses like a passive word. A very passive word, very good. The package is just kind of dislodged. All of it sounds as if there is no wrong. The dissolve is turned into a kind of Right, accident that could have happened to you know anyone. Something else. There is nothing said about why she's there, what she's doing. We hear nothing about Mrs. Paul's graph until you're right at the very end, right? The complaint should be dismissed. And now notice that Cardozo starts the bulk of his judgment with an assertion that is also his conclusion. This is probably not how you will be taught and encouraged to write persuasive analysis in law. But Cardozo doesn't care, right? <laughs> the very first sentence, the conduct of the defendant's guard, if a wrong, remember he's skeptical about whether it's a wrong, so if a wrong, in its relation to the holder of the package was not a wrong in its relation to the plaintiff standing far away. That's it. That's his conclusion. <coughs> there might have been a wrong. It was not a wrong done to her, to someone far away. Do you think that we can have a legal principle that depends on how many feet or meters you are from somebody? No, <coughs> right? It's ridiculous. But he uses this concrete description of the actual distance, which he kind of makes up, to <coughs> substitute, right, to kind of conjure up an image of a metaphoric <coughs> distance. There is this distance between these two, and when you have that distance, that even if there's wrongful behavior, that wrong might <coughs> result in a duty owed to someone else, someone close, here the holder of the package, right? The package holder could say, look, you wrecked my fireworks. Probably not, right? <laughs> but if it had been something valuable and had broken, then yes, right? Well, Island Railroad would have had to pay damages to repair. 
says, but that does not apply. There is no duty to someone plaintiff standing far away. Good. <clears throat> Why does Cardozo do this? Right? Well, Cardozo is said to often go beyond omissions, even misleading ones, and to make up facts. In fact, in his essay, and I will pass around this book, uh, on literature and other essays, in one of the essays in here, he says, I often say that one, a judge writing a judicial opinion, that one must permit oneself and that quite advisedly and deliberately a certain margin of misstatement. <laughs> There's no problem with admitting this. This is what a judge sometimes, he says, should do intentionally. Misstate. And we will see <clears throat> why he does that uh, here. Okay, so I'm going to pass um, this around just so that well, I don't expect you to start reading his essays, but there's something else interesting about uh, this book that I'll uh, come back to. Um, in the first page here, the flyleaf, you will see a signature, P.H. Winfield, who is a tort textbook writer in England and a scholar. And then underneath it says, Reviewed for the LQR. Anyone? it up in your blue book, Law Quarter Review, October 1931. That's an important date. So the book by Cardozo, reviewed, written and reviewed, it's not a very interesting review essay, but reviewed for the Law Quarterly Review, October 1931. Why does that matter? And the book has turned up in our law library, which uh, you will see in... <coughs> My article about Paul's graph, which will just feel like a review of today's session that you will have available after class, <clears throat> I use as a kind of way to suggest that reading Paul's graph at McGill has a very special kind of flavor to it. Percy Winfield, the professor who reviews Cardozo's book, gave a series of lectures in 1931 in India, and in those lectures suggests that there needs to be some underlying principle that ties together the different relationships in which one person may owe a duty of care to another in the tort of negligence. Those essays and Winfield's other scholarly writing and books were something that Lord Atkin in the House of Lords was well aware of. And in 1932, in the House of Lords, we have the Paul's graph moment, but of course it's Mrs. Donahue, not Mrs. Paul's graph. So these two women, as these two plaintiffs, become the stories from which these important judgments about the <coughs> duty of care, the neighbor principle, in Lord Atkins' words, in Donahue and Stevenson. And this idea, the same idea, right, that you owe a duty to those people who are in your orbit. Just as Cardozo doesn't call Mrs. Paul's graph, doesn't ask whether Mrs. Paul's graph is a neighbor or not. That's not the language he uses. You remember, where does Lord Atkin get that language? That's his unique contribution. He's well aware of Cardozo's work. In fact, in the full judgment in Donahue and Stevenson, all the judges in the House of Lords cite to Justice Cardozo. They do not cite to Justice Cardozo in Paul's graph, interestingly. They may not find those four uh, paragraphs so persuasive. They cite to an earlier case that is also a Manufacturer's liability case decided by Cardozo, 1918, New York Court of Appeals, <coughs> McPherson and Buick, where <coughs> the manufacturer of the Buick, right, the car, is found liable to the person who's driving the car who is hurt. 
It's the same as the ginger beer manufacturer and Mrs. Donahue, who gets sick, having saying that she ingested bits of decomposed snail. And so the House of Lords, very aware of Cardozo's work here, Cardozo does in 1918 what the House of Lords does in 1932. And in between 1928, we have Paul's graph where Cardozo is emphasizing, underlining, reiterating the centrality of relationship. Again, he doesn't call it a neighborly relationship, but it's the same idea, right? The centrality of this relationship between defendant and plaintiff. So where does the neighbor language where it come from? The Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments, but found in the same source. <laughs> yes, from the Bible, right? That's okay. <laughs> Close. But um, yes, both <clears throat> Old Testament and New Testament, this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, and that's where Lord Atkin gets this metaphor of the neighbor, and then says, of course, in the Torah of Negligence, we don't have to love our neighbor, but <clears throat> we must Right? Uh, apologize to, compensate for the harm done to our neighbor as a result of our <laughs> failure to act reasonably. <clears throat> okay, so we looked a little bit at how Cardozo sets up the facts. Um, we uh, now connected this emphasis in his judgment to his earlier judgment, McPherson and Buick, very much as John Stevenson on the facts, the product liability, manufacturer's liability case, and to uh, um, the 1932 judgment that pulls the tort of negligence together in the Atkins' hands and says, we're not going to have a duty of care owed in particular categories of relationship. Professor Smith will talk about this a little more uh, next week when he goes back to Donahue and then moves uh, forward from Donahue. <coughs> But instead have this sort of underlying principle, something that Winfield had talked about and that uh, uh, was also, of course, resident in Cardozo's approach to negligence. Sorry, don't the hand. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, just given his affinity for stretching facts and uh, Leo informed me that he failed to buck his bar exam five times. Is yeah. it possible that, like, that's a, that's a, a, a person with a massive inferiority complex who's, like, just desperate for this, like, grand moment, or just, like, a terrible judge? And, you know, I don't know, just, like, giving both those things to be like, isn't it kind of weird that we're giving uh, maybe like, a judge who lies <laughs> so much thought across the evil world? Yeah. And he's just been, like, I don't know, like, dismarred. <laughs> New York Supreme Court and uh, was actually disbarred on a fraud charge. <laughs> <laughs> Cardozo, Benjamin Cardozo, is not only known as the most literary judge, but the judge, one of the judges with a reputation for the highest integrity, professional in, and an individual integrity in the history of U.S. judging. Interesting. So, <laughs> now, <laughs> Justice Frank Ecobucci, retired justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, tells an interesting story, um, but a fun story from his first year as a law student at University of British Columbia. One of his professors told all the students that they were to pick any judge and write a little essay about the significance of that judge. And so Frank Ecobucci, who it turns out, this is the Italian theme between Paul's graph and uh, his story. So it turns out, had been told as an undergraduate student at UBC that with a last name like his, law school was out of the question at the time. So he said, forget that, I'm going. And he did. So in his first year, he thought, I am going to find an Italian judge. And I'm going to write about that judge. And so he found Cardozo. And he thought, before doing any research, and though there was no internet, so you actually had to go to the library and look at right? He thought that he had found a role model, right? an Italian-American famous judge. 
It turned out that indeed he was famous and perhaps in some ways served as a role model, <clears throat> although perhaps we would not want any other judges to be quite as Cardozo-like as he was. Um, but Cardozo was actually a Sephardic Jew. Um, his family had come from Portugal at the turn of the 19th century um, to New York State. <clears throat> and who, as I say, um, whose father had been a lawyer and a uh, judge. And <clears throat> Cardozo, known for this um, just dedication to the truth, and professional responsibility, and at the same time, someone who says part of what a judge does is literary. And we work with what we have here, and he makes this very clear. <clears throat> he had um, been involved in meeting with uh, scholars in tort law in the US in the early 1920s to talk about the importance of the duty of care in the court of negligence. And he had practiced his ideas with peers, but not judges, interestingly, scholars, writing their tort law textbooks, and asking about whether this duty of care notion could act as a limiting mechanism for the scope of liability to compensate for the consequences of one's carelessness or negligence. Many of the scholars thought that they already had a limiting mechanism, and it worked perfectly well. What was the limiting mechanism? Pointing to my Andrews people. Causation. Proximate cause. We're going to see in a few minutes, but that doesn't mean causation in the way that we've already seen it last term. Not about factual link. But whether we feel that the consequences, the factual consequences of the wrongfulness should indeed be within the scope of responsibility of the wrongdoer. That was a notion of proximate cause. It existed. It worked as a limit. Most tort scholars, and it turns out most judges, thought that that was where the restraints were put on the scope of responsibility. Cardozo insisted that there was something prior to figuring out whether there was any proximate causal link. And you'll notice, right in this judgment, he says proximate cause is therefore foreign to the case in front of us. Why? He says we never even get there, people. Right? We might have a wrong and a factual link and injury, but there was no duty owed. Mrs. Paul Scrapp had to establish a right to be one of the people who deserve to be protected from the consequences of the guard's negligence. And she is not that. She has no such right. There is no relationship between the guard and Mrs. Paul Scrapp. And he just repeats that over and over again, right? He never really tells us why it is that it would be unforeseeable, because remember the provision? He says this is extravagant to imagine that the guards doing something negligent over here could possibly, as a result of their behavior, injure someone over here. He never really tells us why he repeats it over and over and asserts in these right, long, dense paragraphs, followed by a whole bunch of sources. Right? Case names, doctrine, right? but he doesn't actually unpack those, he just lists them all, as if to say, see, right? there must be a duty of care, oh, there must be a relation, <clears throat> risk, in Port's relation, there is no such relationship here. And it is an a priori hurdle that must be gotten over before anything else can happen, before we can have any possible responsibility, and definitely before we start to ask whether the stammer was something that is a consequence 
of one's wrongdoing for which one should be responsible. <coughs> so that's And when those weird things happen, 
Andrew says, the answer is not to say, oh, I don't owe a duty to you, Mrs. Paul Scrap. You are not one of the people in my orbit. But rather to say, OK, I owe a duty not to hurt anyone. She's one of the anyones, right? She's another. She was hurt, just as Andrew spends the first half of his judgment denying the centrality of this need to establish a relationship between dependent and plaintiff. The need to establish that the plaintiff is indeed the neighbor for the defendant. He says, we don't need to do that. We never needed to do that. You know that when you act wrongfully, carelessly, you might hurt someone, and when it's the someone who is hurt as a result of your actions, that someone will ask you to be responsible, to compensate. At that point, we can say, yeah, but really, like, am I responsible for that, that thing that happened to you? That's the emphasis of, of Andrews, right? This question of whether the thing that happens, the consequences, are, what's the word that he uses? What do they need to be in order to establish liability? Proximate, right? <laughs> they need to be proximate. Lots of things may be caused in fact. And you may be able to say, but for, no problem. Not all of those things will be understood to be the proximate consequences of the wrongdoing. And now Andrews is going to tell us how we're going to figure out whether we have a proximate causal link or whether, and this is the opposite of proximate, the thing that happened, the injury that happened, is rather than proximate, remote. Because if we characterize it as remote, that means that the wrongdoer is not responsible. Not again because no duty was owed, but because that thing that happened as a factual result of the wrongdoing is not on me as a wrongdoer. I'm not responsible for that. There must be this proximate causal link. And this is where Andrews seems to kind of not help us out too much. Right? He says, think of a stream, and we take a pebble, and we throw it in, and we look at the ripples, and we count the ripples, and at some ripple, we say, that's it. <laughs> right? That's how we do it. And then he admits that that's how we do it. Right? That's what you pulled out here. <coughs> so how we do it? It's a matter of convenience, public policy, a rough sense of justice. We arbitrarily decide which ripple <coughs> to stop at. Right? A little pebble caused all those ripples, in fact. But at some point, I'm going to say, ah, oh, those ripples don't belong to me. I'm not responsible for that. Does anyone want to stand up for Andrews? Does he help us out at all to figure out how to do this work? And this is work that you're going to be, if you look ahead in your course outline, you'll be, depending on the section, kind of starting as you're introduced to it at least before reading week, and then continuing after reading week with an intense exploration of this idea of proximate cause. <coughs> Andrews does give us guidance. He sounds as if he's just kind of throwing up his hands and saying, we just can't do better than this. It turns out that doctrine writers in the civil law, and in particular civil law systems, that have only proximate cause as a way to limit responsibility. Because in any system where the obligation is general, owed to all, owed to another, then you can't limit with that. Right? You can't use Cardozo's idea of duty of care. 1457 does not lend itself to Cardozo's analysis. But that doesn't mean we don't lend it. We do. We use this proximate cause idea. And doctrine writers, and you will see judges, working with proximate cause can't do much better than Andrews. They try. They try to use different words to explain why this is the ripple at which responsibility ends. 
but it's very, very hard to articulate exactly how to do that work. But as I say, Andrews does help us out, and he helps us out in a way that you will see in March resonates with what the judges are doing, and in particular what the judges are doing in put up the sheet that I hope you all got. What the judges are doing. In interpreting Article 1607 of the Civil Code. 1607 says that basically you're only responsible for whatever can be characterized as an immediate and direct consequence. This turns out to be a question not just of factual causal link, which yes, of course, has to be there, but of proximate causal connection. Do we have a proximate cause? The judges will ask the questions that Andrews lists on his fifth to last um, paragraph. It's a long paragraph that starts, there are some hints that may help us. And I encourage you to kind of mark this paragraph and put a little asterisk and say, come back to this in March when you're looking at proximate cause in depth. And he says, and this is where he gives us some guiding questions that the judge must ask, that in fact make it not an arbitrary decision. He says the proximate cause must be at the least something without which the event would not happen. Well, that's not telling us anything new, that's just the factual link. Of course that's the end. The court must ask itself whether there was a natural and continuous sequence between cause and effect. Was the one a substantial factor in producing the other? Was there a direct connection between them without too many intervening causes? Is the effect of cause on result not too attenuated? Is the cause likely in the usual judgment of mankind to produce the result? Or by the exercise of prudent foresight, could the result be foreseen? Is the result too remote from the cause? And here we consider remoteness in time and space. And at the end of the paragraph, he says, <clears throat> we draw an uncertain and wavering line, but draw it we must as best we can. That is the task, the hard task of the judge. You must draw this uncertain and wavering line <coughs> between the wrongdoing that happens at point A and the particular consequence of that wrongdoing, the injury, that happens over here at point B. And so he gives us this set. Now he doesn't prioritize those questions. He doesn't say which is the one that's the clincher, right, will tell us. He does include in the question a question of foreseeability. So interesting, before he said the question is not answered, right, because what happened is unusual, unexpected, unforeseen, or unforeseeable. But he does, in the list of questions that he'll get asked to help us figure out whether there is proximate cause, says one of the questions should be, was this the foreseeable consequence of the behavior? Again, he doesn't say that answers the question, but he says it will be relevant. Okay. <clears throat> Water. Now, I said earlier that both judges are right and both judges are wrong. Let me talk first about why both judges are wrong. Is there a relationship between Long Island Railroad and its employees, the guards, and Mrs. Paul's graph? Of course, there is an obvious relationship. It is a relationship that you've been studying and thinking about since September. There is a contractual relationship. She is holding a ticket. Of course she is within the foreseeable victims 
of the negligence either of the railroad or of its employees, the guards. Cardozo conveniently does not address that possible argument, but insists that Mrs. Paul's graph kind of fell out of the air, right? That who knew that there was this person standing on the platform <laughs> to whom a duty might be owed. Do you think it matters to Cardozo that the package had fireworks and nobody knew that the package would have fireworks? Of course it does, right? So Cardozo asserts that there is no claim on the part of Mrs. Paul's graph, but he does so by saying Mrs. Paul's graph is owed no duty, rather than saying, in a way that perhaps would have been more convincing, that there's no way that we could have imagined, and therefore we shouldn't hold the guards responsible for this, or one on the railroad responsible for this, that scales would fall over on Mrs. Paul's graph as a result of the platform shaking, as a result of fireworks exploding that came in the form of a package that looked completely innocuous. But he doesn't give that explanation. Why? Because to talk about that would be to talk about what? And he says, this case is not about this. It's the Andrews people answer. Proximate cause, right? So on the reasoning of Andrews, that is, is there, <coughs> is it appropriate, is it persuasive to say that the guards were doing was the proximate cause of the stammer suffered by Mrs. Paul's crack? We could say, no, there's no proximate cause. But the judge who talks about proximate cause a little ironic, right? We could actually justify the bottom line of Cardozo's judgment probably more easily by talking about proximate cause. Just as Andrews says, of course, a duty was owed to Mrs. Paul's graph, now we've got to figure out proximate cause. He talks about it in the abstract. How does he teach us about proximate cause? What does he do for a whole part of his judgment? He gives different examples. Yes, he gives different examples. Hypotheticals. You all know about hypotheticals, right? He's giving you a hypothetical. It has an A and a B and a C and a D. He's not so creative. He doesn't give the names, right? And he's asking, right, when this happens, is A owed? <clears throat> all of them are owed to duties, but, right, is what happens to A, does that fall within the scope of liability, B, C, and D? So he's giving us a little lesson on how to figure out on the facts, which situations look like a situation of proximate cause, and which situations look like a situation of remoteness, in which case there would be no liability. <coughs> and then he finally gets to the end, and guess what he has to do by the end? He's got to do what he just said he's going to do here, which is figure out whether there's proximate cause in this case. And what does he tell us? Anyone notice? Right at the end of Justice Andrews' judgment, He's got to turn to this judgment, this, these facts at some point. Patrick? Did you say that all, all of those were uh, slightly open to the space, there's no remoteness in time? Yes, there's no remoteness. The act was negligent. For its proximate consequences, the defendant is liable. Why? Where is there a connection between what and what, according to Andrews? Yeah?
happened to Mrs. Paul's graph? The scales, well that's a little weird that scales toppled over, he says, but that's not so weird as to take this beyond the ripple, right, <clears throat> that I think lies within the responsibility of the wrongdoer and by vicariously Long Island Railroad. But that's the wrong question. He had to ask whether there was a proximate link between the negligence of the guard and what happened to Mrs. Paul's practice. This is why both judges beg the question shamelessly. They are both wrong. They are fudging it, right? Both. One to make this point, give this lecture on duty of care. One to tell us that the way to deal with cases like this is through the lens of proximate cause. Why are they both right? Because they are both right in their exposition of <clears throat> how these mechanisms operate. That yes, in Anglo-American, Canadian, Court of negligence, we do ask whether there is a duty of care owed by the defendant to this plaintiff. Not this named plaintiff, but to a person in the group of people who could be harmed in this way. And we will see <laughs> over the coming few sessions, starting in depth with Professor Smith's plenary next Friday, but that duty of care central to the tort of negligence plays a very important role in shaping the obligation and responsibility for the consequences. But Justice Andrews is also <coughs> right. Coexistent with the duty of care in Anglo-American Canadian tort of negligence is the mechanism of proximate cause. We also ask and demand that there be a proximate link between the wrongdoing on one hand and the harm, the damage that occurs on the other. And it may well be, and in fact usually is, in a factual situation like Paul's graph, Paul's graph being this weird case, right, of kind of unexpected facts, one after the next, kind of taking you in a place that you didn't anticipate, no one could anticipate, that is precisely the kind of case that turns to the mechanism of proximate cause. And that's how we would usually analyze a case like Paul's graph. Indeed, most tort law writers, scholars in the US would say, um, Andrews, in a sense, wins the day here. It's four to three for Cardozo for Mrs. Paul's graph. And sure, duty of care does shape the tort of negligence, but this kind of case is usually approached not by saying the duty was owed to the passenger standing on the platform, but by saying, look at this weird thing that happened, the damage that happened does not fall within the scope of responsibility because it is remote. It doesn't satisfy our requirement of proximate cause. When we work with the CCQ that has a general obligation to another, 1457, that rejects this notion, this a priori notion of defining the relationship between the two parties before deciding whether any obligation was owed by one to the other, then we only have proximate cause to work with. 1607 plays a very important role in delineating responsibility in a system that doesn't use duty of care and also in a system that does use duty of care. These judges have not made a mistake about which tradition they're working in, right? It's not like Cardozo is our common law person here and somehow Andrews is in the wrong place. They're both in the New York Court of Appeals. They're both telling us that both of these ideas coexist not just in an integrated trans-systemic classroom, but actually in the law, right? that they coexist, they work together. So in Anglo-American Canadian common law, in the tort of negligence, we have both integrated the duty of care and proximate cause, 
And in Quebec civil law, you will actually see over the coming week little glimpses of the possibility of borrowing some of this duty of care idea, but generally we work with proximate cause as our only and strong delineating mechanism. Okay. <clears throat> Let me stop there just for a second just to see if there are any questions on the substance of the judgments. And then I'll use the last few minutes to talk a little bit, as I uh, promised at the beginning, about the form. Yeah. So in common law, if you consider both duty of care and proximate cause, yeah. then is there a possibility where a duty is owed, but the proximate cause is so far fetched? Yeah. 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 Lots of cases. And as I say, you will be focusing on those in the month of March, right? Where what we're really focused on is proximate cause. To give you a little heads up on this, there's a case that Justice Andrews cites from England where he talks about shaping liability on the basis of proximate cause, direct causal link, called <coughs> polemis. And you will read polemis. And then you will read what happens after polemis in the English courts to kind of refine the questions that get asked about how to establish a proximate causal link. So when you see polemis, possibly just before reading week, possibly just after reading week, remember just to say it, Ruth. And as you work your way through some weird factual situations that are illustrating proximate cause <coughs> analysis, go back to Andrews and that paragraph where he says, right, there are hints that may assist us. Any other substantive questions? Yeah? Uh, what I'm struggling with is the difference between the relationship that Cardozo speaks about, the duty of care Cardozo yeah. speaks about, and the general duty of care yeah. that uh, Andrews speaks about. What, what is the difference between those two? Well, <coughs> I'm going to make Professor Smith do something for me. Well, the difference. First of all, this lecture. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And this lecture is an introduction to more in depth discussions that you will be having in class on one, duty of care in the tort of negligence. And as I said earlier, Professor Smith is going to go back to Donahue and kind of push what duty of care might do, why is it helpful, how does it work as a mechanism that is central to the tort of negligence. Um, and it's also an introduction to the conversations that we will have on what we mean by a general obligation in 1457, that is, that the obligation is owed to another we will see that in the history of Quebec civil law, there's a moment at which there's a disagreement about whether to do the Cardozo kind of thing and actually to use that another to limit or whether to take it kind of at face value, that the duty is owed truly to any other. And we will look at that. But that's right, the simple answer is to say the difference between these two notions of duty I mean, and this is an obvious, but a little bit superficial answer, is the difference between duty of care and the tort of uh, negligence in the English tradition of the common law and a general obligation, sometimes uh, slightly differentiated as in the German code, but a kind of more general obligation as we see in the Napoleon uh, adopted by the uh, <coughs> Civil Code of Lower Canada now. But that, as I say, is a starting point, right? That's a kind of a rough and ready kind of distinction. And then you will see um, um, movement in both directions, kind of uh, using the duty of care as a shaping mechanism only in particular and so-called problematic uh, situations. I'll name them here. I'm not going to explain them. This is an intro, right? But the nervous shock pure economic loss, duty to rescue, those will be uh, state liability, those will be some of the places in which the tort of negligence in the common law tradition uses the duty of care to kind of shape responsibility, uh, and both use proximate cause um, to uh, 
to decide basically how far the ripples go, right? And whether the consequence in a particular case can be characterized as the immediate and direct consequence of the wrongdoing. And we will find that immediate and direct takes on more significance than simply finding a factual uh, causal link. Yeah. Just to follow up. Yeah. Um, then, is the difference then between, is the difference how, how Cardozo uses the duty of care in defining or limiting responsibility? And whereas with uh, Andrew seems to serve as a baseline assumption, and then use approximate cause as sure. your arguments. Yeah, notice that Cardozo says negligence in the air is not a wrong, right? So I'm going to act wrongfully until I have actually hurt someone. Well, that hurting someone would be enough as a trigger for how Andrews understands the obligation and how we understand 1457. Cardozo would say, I want to know who the someone is. <coughs> is the someone within my provision, my foreseeability? One critique of this is to say, well, we already paid attention to what's foreseeable to you as the wrongdoer. When did we do that? To figure out what? Good, whether there's fault at all, whether you acted reasonably. So one response would be, why do you as a defendant, or why do we care about the perspective of the defendant to determine not only whether that person acted reasonably, but how far to whom does the obligation extend? And you will see in the language of foreseeability used. You will also see Professor Smith will talk to us about how foreseeability perhaps doesn't do enough limiting, and that we actually turn to another word to describe the relationship that is necessary. This is where I always tell my students that tort law is uh, kind of sadly um, deficient in terms of the expansiveness of its vocabulary. What word do we use? Proximate. The relationship must be proximate. The plaintiff must be proximate to the defendant. That's different. And the consequences, the damage, must be the proximate consequence of the wrongdoing. Okay, I'm going to leave that substance, I thought, with a promise that a few weeks from now, you'll look back to this lecture and to the article that I've written based on the lecture, we will see, and you will understand it much, much better. Okay? Now, I just want to uh, <clears throat> say finish off with a few observations about the style of writing, the way in which the judgments are structured. And I've already <clears throat> uh, uh, mentioned this. <laughs> But here, right, if you go out of this room thinking, okay, got it, Cardozo common law, Andrews civil law, right, well, I've already told you, no, they coexist, they are integrated, it's not kind of one or the other. But we could flip this on its head for the style of the judgment. This very dense scholarly assertion, principles, not dealing with the facts, the scenario. Actually, we've seen perhaps misstating the facts on purpose, but clearly not concerned with Mrs. Paul's graph and I don't know what happened to her. But instead, keeping the conversation at a very theoretical level, that is usually associated with civil law doctrine, and that's the style of Cardozo's judgment. And he's conscious of that. Indeed, one might imagine Cardozo kind of wishing that there were a civil code with an article that stated his principle here, right? This principle of the need for a relationship, a duty of care owed to the foreseeable plaintiff. And then you could imagine the judgment as kind of setting up that principle, the article of the code, and the rest is interpretation repeating what it means, what its significance is, and then, boop, the answer pops out at the end, right? We've got a lot of argument, or showing how it is we get to that answer. Andrew's style of judgment, very different. Arguably more common law in nature, 
using metaphor, using analogy, using examples, taking the reader by the hand, responding first to Cardozo, <coughs> the majority judgment, and then turning right to a discussion of this element of the law and illustrating it. Not asserting it, acknowledging that it will have to be worked out on the facts. But there is no easy sentence or definition that can be given to proximate cause, but that instead we will have to develop a kind of intuitive feel for it. And that is indeed what judges do with it, is that from experience and reading about how other cases on the facts gave rise to a decision that indeed there was proximate cause or no, this was remote, that there will be a kind of analogizing that happens in any case that comes along to try and see whether this looks like a factual scenario that in the past has been characterized as one of proximate cause or whether it looks like other cases where instead we said what happened was remote and therefore not the responsibility of the defendant. Finally, I think both are teachers. I said that back earlier. Right? Cardozo, you could imagine, up at a podium, I don't think he'd be walking around, he would just deliver this judgment and he would hammer it home. Right? Make sure that you understand that in the principle, this kind of grounded core idea that structures the duty and the tort of negligence, that is its very foundation, he would just repeat it, perhaps send you off to look at some doctrine and cases, but you can discuss them. Right? He would just make sure that you got the point that there's no way you could leave and think, I'm not sure about whether there has to be a relation between the defendant and the plaintiff. Andrew's a little more meandering, right? Trying things out, again, trying to illustrate, using examples, seeing what the students think, how would they respond to the claims of A or B or C or D, how would they compare, how would they react to the story? Now, I said before that the two substantive approaches, duty of care and proximate cause, substantive approaches to figure out how to delineate the responsibility, coexist and are integrated. Of course, the styles also coexist and are integrated. And you, of course, are well versed in working with both styles and with a mix and with understanding that neither, that is not easy, right, obvious, simplistic, <clears throat> or it would be simplistic to kind of take the style of Cardozo and label it as civilian, or take the style of Andrews and label it as common law. Indeed, there is more complexity, there is more mixing, and of course, uh, in a trans-systemic classroom, there is a constant uh, mixing. Now here to, well I should say, so, so in that sense, no one is asking you to choose. We don't choose duty of care or proximate cause. We don't ask which one is the better one to delineate responsibility. We understand both and we understand uh, how both work, why they might be used, what their features are, and how they're integrated. In that sense, as I started, right, Paul Streff is a great McGill case. Now it's also, you might have, before coming to class, or you might want to do this after, if you look on the internet, you can see lots of fun things about Paul Streff. It is so famous that you will find a whole, a, a first year towards class, and I can't remember which American law school, who have reenacted Paul Streff with Lego, so look that up later. Uh, if you watch The Good Wife in, Season four, there's a case where one of the law, uh, the lawyers says, you know, something about proximate cause, actually. It's just an end of judgment that's being cited and says, Paul's graph and Long Island Railroad, right? Everybody knows Paul's graph. But it's a particularly nice uh, case here because as I hope I've shown, right, it illustrates <coughs> what Patrick Glenn would insist 
in terms of legal traditions and systems, that is their permeability, their commensurability, the importance of understanding each on its own, but also understanding how they interact or intersect. Um, and also a lovely example of what Ron McDonald would insist on as we study and think about law, that is the porousness of the legal systems that order our lives and the ways in which we move across them, constantly across these boundaries, and pay attention to these interactions. <clears throat> and so a very nice class to think about the contributions of both uh, Professor Glenn and uh, Professor McDonald at this faculty. Finally, Justice Cardozo in a 1930 convocation speech at Columbia University, it was mentioned earlier that he kept failing the bar exam. I'm sure he's kind of proud of failing the bar exam. Um, he actually was at Columbia Law School at the cusp of the change at Columbia to become more like Harvard in the early 1900s. The late 1800s, Harvard had broken new ground by introducing the case method, focusing on cases, appellate cases in the classroom, and scrapping what had previously been the curriculum in a law faculty at a top US university, which was continental philosophy and doctrine reading. The study of Roman law, working in Latin, reading philosophy, that was how you studied law. You did not work with cases. And that is how Cardozo was at Columbia had done, was in the middle of his second year in what he <coughs> says was a very boring legal education, reading all these texts. When the students were given a choice, they could graduate after two years, which is how long the program was at the time, or they could stay for a third year and experience the introduction of this new case method developed by the dean at Harvard. Like that. Cardozo left. He <laughs> wasn't interested. He got out of there. He went back to give a convocation speech at the university and I want to just cite this to you because I think it could be a, a welcome speech to students at McGill Law. We have never cut ourselves off altogether from the stream of continental law and learning, or if stream be too strong a word, from the overflows and the seepings that have crept beyond the backs and dams. But the kinship, after all, is something deeper and more significant than any that can be explained by these borrowings and exchanges, these imitations and analogies, conscious and unconscious. The kinship in its most profound realities has its origin in that imaginative outlook upon law, which I spoke of as the outlook of the university. It's very nice. You will find that site in the article if you're um, interested in kind of rereading it and letting it seep in. Um, in a uh, final essay, uh, Cardozo's that I'll uh, quote in his essay called The Method of Philosophy, Cardozo writes, the accidental and the transitory will yield the essential and the permanent. But this accidental moment of Mrs. Paul's graph, he uses, it turns out he was waiting for Mrs. Paul's graph to come along. If this, hadn't, this case hadn't been in, it would have been the next case, doesn't matter. He was waiting for a case that he could turn into something essential and permanent. And of course, Justice Andrews, dubious about whether there are many things in law that are essential and perfect. And finally, just for a good laugh, one more fact remains to be added to the extraordinary events that linked Helen Paul's graph and Benjamin Cardozo. On August 10, 1991, in Hamburg, New York, Lisa Newell, who is the first cousin four times removed of Benjamin Cardozo, married J. Scott Garvey. Mr. Garvey is the great-grandson of Helen Paul's graph. <laughs> <laughs> See you next Friday. <laughs>